We're already laughing anyways. All right, everybody. Welcome to episode four of the Cluster Buck podcast. Joining us today is Hunter Ziegler in the middle. You're not laughing yet. Nico Galdoni yeah, in the time. green and Blake Wallerman um, over in the corner in the camo hat. Uh, we're going to be talking to Blake today um, about hunting, fishing, everything in the outdoor industry, but we're really going to be focusing on Blake's career. Um, he is a photographer and videographer in the outdoor industry. So Blake has worked with some of the biggest companies in the industry um, and in a world full of Instagram and influencers. Um, Blake's kind of made it in the outdoor world to say. Yeah. So, how does it how does it feel to be an influencer? <laughs> Don't ever call me that again. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to be called an influencer, Jordan, but I would put him in that category. I would I would he's not a, put myself he's a in that photographer, category. Videographer, um, for sure. Like his his photos and videos are probably more than you would expect from, you know, what you might term as an influencer. Um, he's made a career out of it. He's not someone who's just, you know, on the computer talking like the three of us do, Hunter. So yeah, yeah, we're amateurs, and I feel like you've reached a professional level. I mean, you're doing it for a living now, right? I am. Yeah, I so, still feel like I'm an amateur, but <clears throat> no, I mean that's that's as professional as it gets. If you're getting paid to do that, and I mean, I think at any one time. Uh, especially a few years ago, me or you would have jumped at the opportunity if somebody would have reached out to us and tried to send us some money to go out and do what we love. We would have done it for 20% off a company that we don't even use. <laughs> we still do that at times, so that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Anyway, this, this podcast is brought to you by... <laughs> Sasquatch Tea Company. I don't have the I don't have the tagline, but we'll insert it right here. Sasquatch Tea is America's tea built by Americans for Americans. All Sasquatch Tea's flavors are named after our national parks to represent America and all its natural wonders. Be sure to use the promo code RC10 at checkout on your next purchase to receive ten percent off. How long did you how long did it take you to drive down here tonight? <laughs> like I mean, I didn't time it exactly, but I'd say like fifty-eight minutes and like twenty-four seconds. Yeah, so we we've grown up, we've grown up to pretty close to each other, and really, this is actually the first time that we've met in person, which is kind of crazy. But it's awesome to have you in studio. Yeah, that. glad to be here. Yeah, Jordan owes you some money, apparently. Yeah, Jordan, you better you better write me a check. So. Just uh, you can just you can just send a blank if you want. That's you just write in there whatever uh, <laughs> whatever you think you're worth, and then we'll. That's what we usually call them as blanks. So it's perfect blank check. <laughs> That's not yeah. Um. So <laughs> <laughs> we know. So I think we were talking about our background, Hunter, and just kind of how we all came to know each other, and yeah, just kind of our kind of our start and Blake start in the outdoor, you know, industry. Yeah. So I, I don't know. We've probably followed each other for at least 10 plus years or so. And I have a key point here. I think we played a championship basketball game. I, I can't remember. I, I don't know. It was so long ago at this point. We both, did you graduate in two, 2014? No, I graduated in 17. He graduated in 17. <laughs> See, I don't even, oh, no, it must have so been a different one. Was it your brother? It could have been my brother, but I was a freshman when he was a senior. Oh my so gosh. It could have been, it was probably both of us. You should have told me that before the show, you know? So we didn't even, I don't, we probably didn't play each other. In we that might game. not have. I don't know. I don't really? remember, but. He doesn't remember, yeah. so <clears throat> we're just the, making that up. That would have been the Cesar Valier holiday tournament championship game. Yeah, I mean, that was like our shining moment as a town. Johnson City is the biggest game we ever played in, probably. So, <laughs> Did we win or did you we win? Lost, but we lost. I, I by one. So. By we one? Lost. Yeah. I don't remember that game. That could I could have not been in high school yet. How old are you? 28. Oh, I probably wasn't then. I'm just a wee little guy. I'm only 24. This is only 24. I could have swore the whole time he was our age. He's only a year younger than I am. Younger than you. That really That really throws me for a loop. That's crazy. He's younger than Nico? Expect... Yes, he is younger than Nico. Yeah, well, then he probably wasn't because Nico was, yeah, Nico was way below us. Yeah. 
Yeah, we can move oh, on from so that. Never mind. Nobody wants. So never nobody mind. wants did, to hear about that. We did that. not play a championship basketball <laughs> game against one another. I made it up in my head. You know, I thought we were associated in some way, but apparently we were just following each other on Instagram. You'd have probably hated me anyway if we'd have played. You'd be like, "This kid's freaking." Well, dirty. see, me and him would have matched up to each other because we're both about the same height. We're both like four foot seven. Yeah. We would definitely guard each other. Yeah. So, we so actually. If you could see it, another angle of this podcast, and it was at the floor, we were sitting on blocks underneath our chair just to jack us up high enough to get the mic underneath us a little bit. So that says a little bit about how tall we are over here. I am not on blocks. He's not on blocks. <laughs> he doesn't need them. Nico. He's a Division One football player. So um, getting back to <laughs> photography and videography, me and Hunter got into it in high school. We kind of, you know – started getting interested in filming gear hunting um we came up with you know what is now recruit creative um, when did you like get into you know filming and photography yeah so it was about the same time for me i got my first camera i don't know i was probably like a junior in high school maybe um maybe even a little younger sophomore or so um you want me to just kind of like go on a little tangent was it? here about like my background? Was yeah, it was a it was straight up video camera. Or so was it, it was a Canon Rebel T5i, just uh, like it's a, like DSLR, right? Yeah, just yeah. A, a good old like three hundred dollar Walmart camera, and it had yeah. one kit lens. And I mean, I guess I, I guess it was before that because when I was in grade school, I had a little Sony Handy Cam from Walmart that I would like film. I think I had one with. of those too. I think we all might have had one yeah. at one point. So I guess that's technically like where I got my start in video and then the photo game started when i was in high school and i got that that canon and i just it was actually my mom's camera and you know it was like when the whole like social media thing and like hunting photography thing was like really starting to get big and i'm like oh this is kind of cool you know it's like if i kill a deer i want a good photo with it i don't want just iphone photos so i just started using that camera a little bit and it just kind of like turned into a little bit of a hobby and then long story short now do it for a living yeah was there ever a point in there where you felt like your game really just took off to a whole new level because i know i look back at a lot of our stuff and we were way below average for the longest time and then it was like for us i think it was equipment aided in a way like some of the better technology came out and we got our hands on it and you know we had we started getting jobs and stuff where we could actually afford some of the better equipment yeah. but was there ever a point where you felt like your game took just a huge jump. I mean, I think it was more just experience than anything. Um, you know, like when I first started, it was just like, you know, every now and then I would just like go shoot photos. And then, you know, the more I did it and like when I actually started doing it for work and just got a bunch of experience under my belt and learned things and actually started like shooting with a purpose versus like, Oh, I'm just going to look through here and click the button. Yeah. It, it was like actually shooting with an intent and trying to capture something. That's like when it, things started to really like come together for me. Did you uh, learn from anybody or were you self-taught? I did not self-taught. So <clears throat> I blame everything that I know on YouTube University. I mean, when I was in college, um, you know, I would, that's all I did was watch YouTube and figure things out. And, <clears throat> you know, doing it for work, you know, I've been on shoots and stuff with super talented guys and I've learned stuff from them that I never could learn from anybody else. So just being around them has helped a ton. But like I got my start just, trial and error and youtube do you have a degree is your degree in something to do with this is not it's no. not nothing to do with photography videography no i have an associate's degree in ag business and i have a bachelor's degree in occupational safety and health nice yeah nice so when you went into college um you know you chose that degree were you wanting to be you know a professional photographer videographer or is that just something that kind of happened organically <clears throat> yeah so like when i was in college um you know, when I first went into college, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And you know, I just knew I kind of wanted to be outside. I didn't want to have a, you know, corporate office job and be <clears throat> stuck in a cubicle all day. <laughs> Dang it. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I feel sorry for <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's brutal. Yeah, so it was kind of just like photography was just like a hobby for me at that time. And, you know, I just wanted a job where I was outside. And I didn't think that I wanted to do what I do now for a living because all I wanted to do was hunt. And I was like, oh, I'm never going to have time to hunt if I do that for a living. And so when I was in college, um, you know, I started doing a little bit of, well, we got sent home for COVID. And so I was just doing online school all fall and all spring. And I went on like a couple of shoots, did some TV stuff. And um, 
my junior year going into my senior year, I had an internship with a construction company and like for my degree. And it was literally like the most miserable summer of my life. And I'm like, I'm not doing this for the rest of my life. So it was like, that was like the trigger point for me of like, I got to figure out like how to do this. Um, so that's like when it turned for me and I was like, yeah, I've, I've got to find out how I can do this. So how did you first get your start with, was it with a creative agency or was it just doing freelance stuff? Did somebody reach out to you or did you have to go out and actively chase? Yeah. So, you know, I always tell people that like Instagram built my career and every connection I've ever made has been through something that come from social media, specifically Instagram. Um, the first like legit gig I ever had was filming for bone collector. I didn't know literally anything, had no clue what, ISO meant nothing. And I just happened to be um, good friends with the guy that, that ran their production. And he just called me one day and he was like, hey, he's like, T-Bone needs a cameraman in, in Kansas. He's like, you want to do it? And I was at school and I was like, when COVID was starting and I'm like, ah, oh, man, I don't know. I was like, I don't really want to skip a week of school. And then I'm like, yeah, I want to skip a week of school. And so I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And we ended up getting sent home for COVID anyway. But yeah, that was like the first gig I ever had. Um, and that came strictly from just Instagram. So that was a free, that, like a freelancing role. Yeah, there. that was just like a freelance role. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's interesting because I think a lot of the people, you know, who are out there who, you know, look up to careers and, you know, want to do that for a living. I think getting kind of kicking down the door, getting that start is kind of the biggest hurdle. Um, and I think for really anybody in the industry who is trying to make it in the industry, I think that's probably the biggest question is like, you know, if you were talking to a kid, you know, a 14 year old kid now who wanted to get into it, like what advice would you give them? Um, you said, you know, you built your career through Instagram and to be honest, that's how me and Hunter, you know, that's how we knew you was through Instagram and um, you see how great your photos are. Um, I guess what advice would you give someone who's coming up and is trying to make it? Is it, you know, just trying to put forward the best, you know, Instagram portfolio, get the most followers, you know, to reach as many people as you can? Or, you know, do you think it's better to, you know, be reaching out to people to try to, you know, get your shot that way? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think a little bit of both. Um, you don't need a lot of followers, you just need the right ones. And, you know, whether you have 500 followers or 50,000, as long as you have the right people that see them, that's all that matters. And, you know, when I was when I first got started, and like when I figured out, okay, I want to do this for a living. I like, I want to learn, you know, how these people operate, what their day to day life's like, like what they do. I was reaching out to people every day, you know, whether that was somebody that worked in TV or somebody that worked for a brand. And so like advice that I would give to, you know, younger kids, because like when I was there, what I wish I'd have did is, and I did it a lot, was just reach out to people, um, you know, just ask questions, because most of them are going to respond. You know, I've had young kids reach out to me and, you know, you love that feeling of like, oh, hey, yeah. what do you do for a living? And yeah. like, how can I do that? And like, don't ever be afraid to do that. And then don't be afraid to post your work either. Like if you po if you have content to post every day, like post it. You know, I worked for free for years before I ever got you know, anything paid. And I was strictly from just posting on Instagram. And there's times, you know, when I first got started, I would post 10 days in a row. And it's like, looking back now, like all oh, those photos were terrible, but you know, it's like, that's just how I got started. Yeah. I think that was a big question for me was like how much of it involves networking. Cause to be honest with you, that's, that's a big weakness of mine is just networking. Like I don't, I'm not the personality to just go reach out and that's, you know, that's hurt me as far as like going out and doing freelance stuff. But I've also, we've been trying to do our own thing here. So that's, I feel like I'm not wanting to sacrifice my own time, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm kind of trying to build everything here and not get out and go away from it. But so, so you're saying probably how much, if you could put a percentage to it, how much would you credit that success to actually networking and just meeting people? Because I know like if I go on your Instagram and I went through your timeline stuff last night, when you post a photo, you have like, I don't know how many comments, you have tons of comments of people back and forth. And I think that that has a lot, you know, there's a lot of good that comes with that as far as people connecting and commenting on photos and driving engagement and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, if I, if somebody would post something 
you know, that I looked up to or I was like, oh, I want to know more about them. I just comment on it or reach out to them. And, yeah. you know, I'm the, I'm the same way that you are, like doing like this right here is like out of my wheelhouse. You know, I'm not a right. super social guy and like I'm not one to just make conversation with with random people, but especially when I was younger, but I've kind of broke out of that shell now and yeah. I don't really like have a choice anymore, especially with what I do because I just have to talk to people all the time. Um, and it was tough for me to begin with just reaching out to people because it's like, oh, I don't want to bug them. I don't want to annoy them. And, you know, if you get left on red, you get left on red. You know, yeah. that nobody's ever said anything bad to me for reaching out to him. It, you know, I had a few people that wouldn't respond, but 99% of people are going to reply. And most of those people are willing to, to teach you and tell you things. Um, so just like having the guts to do that for me was like, it was a big step for me, but like, if I wouldn't have done it, I would never be where I'm at now. Yeah. And I think that's something that we can all kind of learn from as far as people in the outdoor industry, when you reach out to them, like Blake made the point earlier, they're happy to help you. They, we want that engagement. Like if somebody reaches out to us, it makes us feel like Kings. So that, that's a big help right there. Just knowing that you can reach out because reaching out to somebody in the outdoor industry with 50 to a hundred thousand followers is way different than reaching out to somebody in Hollywood with 50 to a hundred thousand. Like you're never going to contact that person, but people in the outdoor industry are more than willing to go out of their way to help you. Absolutely. And I think, Hunter, like we've experienced that a little bit too, even in, you know, where we've been, where we have been messaging, you know, we'll reach out to somebody, whether it's a sponsor or it's, you know, you know, I think we've had a lot of different steps on the way up to even this podcast and like the YouTube page. Um, and I know I would send a lot of emails to people who probably drove you nuts because I would, you know, respond to, I'd message Hunter and say, hey, I got a hold of this guy and they want us to do this or this. I think at one point early on, we had reached out to some like local cable channel in Tennessee. I don't know if you remember that hunter, but yeah. we were like sending them this really crappy deer hunting footage of uh, on Sony handy cams that were it was almost so dark outside you couldn't even see the deer. We were sending it to this cable channel and they were like, Yeah, we're gonna air it. And I don't know if it ever did because uh yeah we were it, in network. We couldn't even, you know, we couldn't even watch those videos, but they like took them on and that type um, of material is stuff that I would not like if you played it in front of me right now, I would not watch it because it has like it, <laughs> it would be makes like you cringe a little bit. Oh, definitely. Like when you it have like back to some of the stuff that when we edited, I know a lot of the stuff I when I edited when I was, you know, in high school, we put it on YouTube. We're like, this is it. This this, this is, is it. the and video. It's like, you look back at it now and you're like, oh no, like no. I would not. Yeah, it'd be like I would not feel that again. Two Pope and Youngs, maybe <laughs> standing out in a bean field with some Jason Aldean music playing. <laughs> and I'm talking when the music's playing, it's the whole song. It's not it's just a start to finish. It's not a portion of it. It's 100% copyrighted. I mean, that. But then again, I mean, you can't be afraid to jump out there because if we wouldn't have done that stuff, we wouldn't be here. So exactly. don't be intimidated you get, by it. You get better. You get better as you go. So like you said, you kind of have to put yourself out there and we made some really bad videos for a lot of years and then we just got a little better and a little better and we're probably still not very good at it, but we're, you know. No, and one thing I'll say is you got to kind of, I feel like we've somewhat been successful in reading what's popular at the time. Like right now, YouTube shorts are super popular. So that's helped our channel grow. So we, we've kind of sacrificed on the cinematic, you know, everything's got to be perfect type of stuff and you know went towards the things that are going to to give us that growth so there's something to be said too about reading your audience and not just making the most cinematic thing of all time every time especially I mean, for stuff have, like us people have short attention spans i scroll tiktok all day at work you like, probably got to, you got like, it going right now longer than 10 seconds i don't want to watch it like i i don't watch youtube videos longer than 20 30 minutes um even deer hunting videos so i think we've learned that too that um stuff that maybe we find cool that we think is cool to put in a video because for us it was a really cool experience other people don't want to watch you know us walk back and forth in a field or put binoculars up to our eyes over and over again they're really there you know for the money shot they're there for the deer not us um, so i think that's something that really you know we kind of had to learn as we went to yeah <clears throat> yeah and, and i'll say like the experience or like the content itself is like way more important than the quality like one of the biggest videos that like has ever been used of mine was a deer that I filmed on a Sony handy cam when I was 12 and it's just this giant deer and it just destroys a cedar tree at like 12 yards and I like didn't shoot it cause my brother was hunting it. <laughs> Such an idiot move. <laughs> that but, was a mistake. Yeah. 
I've and, seen that video. Is it Matthews used it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so I just filmed this deer with this little Walmart handy cam and like the quality is atrocious, but the video is cool. And you know, like, yeah, it would have been cooler if it was on a nice camera, but it wouldn't have been as cool on a nice camera if it was like a smaller deer, or, like not a cool experience, you know? So I always think that just like the experience and you know, what you're watching is more important than the quality. Yeah. And those, those Sony handy cams, if I remember right, were probably around 400 bucks maybe when they first yeah. came out. So I think we probably all had the same ones. They had like a, they had a really good zoom on them. Super good to start like self filming with. I mean, it was a perfect camera, but uh, I, I tried to use it on our first elk hunt. I tried to attach one to my uh, my stabilizer on my phone. And I was like, this is perfect. Like, why use a GoPro when I can just put a Sony handy cam? And I, I, I think day one, I broke it. Yeah. Brush and, you know, break and brush and you stuff. You found but, out you didn't have enough clearance between the camera and the arrow when you shot. Shot right through. Yeah, the nah, I mean, we had, but, you know, we you live and you learn. Yeah. Yeah, but I will say that's a, it's a good point to make that you don't, if you're somebody that's getting started, you don't have to have a $2,000 camera. Now, don't get me wrong. It's going to help you to have one. But if you can start out small, especially nowadays, like the technology. I, Jordan, how old are our um, Sony? We got A7S IIs. Those we things are they're probably at least 10 years old. And I I don't know. I, I know that some of the newer model of cameras are, are better, but they're still usable today. It's like the quality is not... They're, there's also a level of like, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, we're not filming for, you know, that's not our livelihood. Like it is for Blake. Like that is for right. us, it's kind of a hobby. Like we kind of have our limitations talent wise and what we're capable of doing. And to be honest, that camera now still years later is probably still more capable than I am. Like the <laughs> capabilities I would get in a better camera. Like, I don't know if I'd be able to make use of it anyway. So I guess uh, to kind of build on that, you're you're technically employed right now by a creative agency. Correct. Yep. <clears throat> and that's called Collectus. Yep. Collectus. So, when did you get started with them? Was this recently, or was yeah, something? fairly recent. Um, I've been there a little under a year. Um, I started there last February full time. I think. Um, how did that start? Was that something they yeah, did? They, how do you uh, how they, do you apply to a job like that? Right. Do they find you, or do you do you write up a resume and like go through an interview process, or like how does that all come to fruition? Yeah, so I'll just give you some background of like how I got started with them. Um, so Collectus is owned by a guy named Austin Thomas. Um, people that work in the outdoor industry probably know who Austin is. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I've known Austin. Austin was like one of the first connections that I made in the outdoor industry. I mean, when I was in early college if not even high school like i was always reaching out to austin like you know he would post a photo and i would send it to him and i would be like hey man like what's your mindset behind this photo how'd you get it you know and he was always like really good about like teaching and and always like gave me advice and stuff and so i just kind of like built a, a relationship with him um and then <clears throat> over the years me and him did some work together um and then just last like last late last year, or I guess now two years ago, um, he, he offered me a job full time. So that's kind of how, how I got started with him. So how did you go from like kind of connecting the link? You said, you know, your first job, you know, someone reached out to you and you've, you know, you filmed T-Bone and Bone Collector. How did you get from, you know, that point to where you are now and kind of the stops along the way? <clears throat> yeah. So when I was in college, um, I did like a little bit of freelance stuff, like if you want to call it freelance, like it was just a few gigs here and there. Like did film for bone collector, film for whitetail properties. Um, just did some other miscellaneous stuff. And then, uh, the following summer, which would have been like my going into my last semester of college, um, Greg Ritz, who has a TV show called hunt masters, um, and a company called Wildcom, He reached out to me on Instagram and he was like, Hey, I need a cameraman in Illinois, um, to film some like, summer whitetail stuff and he's like three and a half four hours from me and so like yeah i can come up <clears throat> so i shot some stuff for him for like three or four days and when i was up there he just kind of like <clears throat> asked me like what i wanted to do like with my life and stuff and i was like i don't really know to be honest i was like you guys, you guys got deep though. yeah we did dude <laughs> it was like a deep talk it's like whoa <clears throat> he's like so what do you want to do with your life and i'm like i don't know I never thought about it I'm like are you like 
offer me a job or yeah. like, are you telling me what to do with my life? Like, what are you getting at here? <clears throat> um, but so I ended up <clears throat> going up there for a few days and then actually ended up going back up there for the youth shotgun season, which is like the first weekend in October and <clears throat> filmed him and his daughters up there. And then like when that trip was over, he was like, Hey, he's like, if you want a full-time job, he's like filming and editing. He's like, I'll hire you. So I was in my last semester of college, but I was online. Um, so I like, I worked for him pretty much full time that fall, but like wasn't full time that fall. Um, I went up, filmed him there. I didn't go on like any out of state trips or anything. Um, filmed him in Illinois, I don't know, four or five times. And then once I graduated college, I started full time with him in January and I worked for him for <clears throat> Out of two years before I started working for Collectus, um, just filming and producing his TV show. And then we did some social media stuff and some other things. But yeah, I was just, all I would do is film and edit TV. That was like, that was like my biggest role. And then now I work for, for Collectus. So that's kind of my journey. So when you work, when you work for Greg, did you have, was the equipment your own? Is that how that works? Or do they provide some of it? Or does he give you like, a payment to go out and purchase better equipment how does that situation work yeah so i mean that's really just dependent on like who you work for but like when i worked for for wildcom and greg um like he provided gear for me i had a sony fx6 and a sony a7s3 and a drone and an assortment of lenses but like when i was freelancing it was it was like all my own stuff um and i would occasionally still use my own stuff for, for photo purposes or, you know, just to have another camera. I would always take my personal camera with me on every trip I went on just to have another camera. Cause I'm kind of reckless with it. So, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so on, on stuff like that, you say you take your own personal camera. Is there something in there that tells you that you can't use like some of the, since you're employed by this guy, it's, does he have an entitlement to, that media that you've shot or, you know, taken a picture of, or is it, you're just pretty good working hand in hand. Like you give him what he needs for his show and then you can take the other stuff on your side and post it on your channel. Or is there, is there yeah. ever a conflict as far as like him going, you know, this is my photo. You're working for me. Yeah. So like when I worked for Greg, um, you know, as long as there wasn't any, like, you know, we were always working with like unreleased products or like things that hadn't come out yet. Um, so it was kind of tough to post stuff, but you know, if it was stuff that didn't have unreleased product or new things or, you know, just things that you could post, like he would have no issue with you posting. Um, and that's like the biggest tr struggle that like with what I do now is most of what we do is, you know, new, like what I'm photo and videoing is, is new product stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I can't post anything until it comes out. It's like, you know, the stuff we're shooting now won't come out until next year. So, yeah, so you could have something really cool happen and be like, man, I got to sit yeah, on this for over a year. Everything for a year. That yeah. could be kind of good in a way though, too, because you could sit back and really yeah. get that best edit possible right. out of it before you go out. And like us, sometimes we get so excited. We're yeah, editing we're photos excited. on the way home from an elk trip, yeah. just flinging them out. We got yeah. them scheduled for a month to come. And then we're like, Dang, this edit look didn't look as good as I thought it did. There's a smudge. There's a smudge on the lens or something. I have a really bad <laughs> habit of posting something. Then I look and I'm like, oh, I thought that smudge is on my phone. No, it's on my lens. Yeah, I'm the same way. And the more I look at a photo, the less I like it. Like I could take yeah, a photo and be like, yeah. this is the best photo I've ever taken. And yeah. I could look at it long enough and be like, I don't like it anymore. Yeah. So to try to transition into some of the more the X's and O's behind it, and we're talking about this uh, to begin with. Um, how much, how often would you clean your camera? Like, do you get, you know, you know, the, the shot we're talking about where like, if you were to look straight up into a blue sky, you can see that debris that's gathered yeah. between the lens and the camera body. And I guess that's from like zooming in and out and it gets sucked in through there. Yes, how often do you go through and like maintain equipment or do you, or you just edit it out? I do, but not as not, as much as I should. Yeah. yeah. I mean, truthfully, <clears throat> I've always viewed my camera as a tool. And, you know, like when I first got it, I'm like, oh, I have this expensive camera. I got to baby this thing. And, but it's like, you know, to get the best stuff, I had to get it nasty and beat up. It's yeah, like, you, you look it. at my camera now, it's like, you know, it was black when I got it. Now it's all like silver because everything's <laughs> just rubbed off of it. Like, and that camera, like 
my main camera is a Canon R5 for photos. Dude, that camera, I've dropped that thing out of a tree. It's been underwater in Maine. Like, I dropped it in New Mexico on an antelope hunt in a dust storm with no lens on it. It's like, I have beat that thing. I don't know how it even turns on anymore. But yes, so, I do not clean it near as much as I should. Building on that, like if you're on like a duck hunt, you know, flooded timber or something, because I know I know I've been in spots where I'm like, man, this is going to be a really fun shoot or a really fun hunt. Um, and you know, maybe it's raining sideways and you're you know you're wading into timber or something, or you know, like you said, antelope hunts are super dusty. And like when I did my antelope hunt keeping my camera, keeping the dirt out of the lens of my camera was probably the most challenging part of the entire hunt. What steps do you take? You know, like if, do you take any steps, you know, like if you're, if you're duck hunting and flooded timber, are there ever a time when you're like, you know what? No, like camera staying in the bag or, um, you know, you use tarps. Are there any, I guess, tricks that you have to like keep your camera clean? I've seen people use like Ziploc bags. I used to put um, like my camera to Ziploc bag. Um, is there anything that you do to keep your camera clean or dry? Yeah. So, I mean, there's never been a time where I'm like, oh, it's too nasty out to keep, to have my camera out. Cause that's a lot of times when you're going to get the best stuff It's just that nasty, gnarly weather. Um, but as far as like keeping my camera clean and you said like a duck hunt, for example, like in the chest pocket of my waders, I'll always keep one, if not two, like lens cloths in there. Cause if not, you're going to be trying to wipe your lens with your sleeve and it's just going to smear. So, and it's always going to get wet and muddy. And you know, like the other day I took a photo of like my dog jumping off of this stand to get a duck and like, you might as well put my camera underwater. Like when it, after he, the splash from him, it was just soaked, dripping water. And like, if I would have tried to wipe it with my sleeve or if I didn't have a lens cloth, like my lens would have been screwed for the next 30 minutes, you know? Um, and as far as like weather goes, yeah, I have like a, it's just a cheap little, like almost like a plastic bag that just has a kind of like, I don't know, just a little strap on the end of it. You just pull tight. It's got a buckle on it. So you just slide it over your camera and then you, pull it tight right at the lens um and that keeps it like as dry as it can be um you know i was i was on a moose hunt in maine when i was filming tv and, and we had sony's and you know like my canon is it can take a lot more than those sony's could and i had that bag on my sony and it was just a torrential downpour all day and like three hours into that hunt my camera just like shut off like it just got wet and just like wouldn't work so i just had to switch to my canon and like I, that's the same hunt. I dropped it underwater and I just like pulled it out real quick and it was like still fine. And yeah, so I try my best to keep it dry, but rarely do I ever. Have you ever got like a really awesome photo that you look back at it and you're like, damn, I had a, I had a drop of water on the lens. Or, oh dude, so many times. Or let me ask you this. Have you ever had it like work in your favor? Like where you've gotten something amazing, but that was just because there was water on the lens. And Very could. rarely, but it's happened maybe like once or twice, but most of the time it works against you instead of for you. So, uh, what about, what about batteries? Like we're talking, uh, cold weather right now. Is yeah. there something, do you keep hot hands on you or anything to keep batteries warm? Or do you keep five or six on you? How many do you usually roll with? Yeah. So, I mean, it just kind of like depends on what, what shoot that I'm on. Um, you know, if I'm just, taking photos in like a one day shoot or something and it's super cold and I'm worried about my batteries dying, you know, I'll keep at least two on me. And what I'll do is I'll keep, um, <clears throat> hot hands either like in a jacket pocket or like in a chest pocket and I'll keep a battery in there with it. And that'll keep your battery warm enough to, to not die. And if I'm like on an actual hunt, what I'll do sometimes if it's super cold is I'll pull a battery out and like, I'll have no battery in my camera and I'll put it like in my chest pocket too. Like if I know I have time to get my battery out before anything happens, then I'll keep a battery in there and just pull it out whenever I know I'm going to shoot something. But it's a little sketchy because, you know, things happen fast. I, but yeah. I think that's a good tip because I know I have had times where you're sitting in the stand for hours and your, battery, your camera's sitting there and then you see something, you flip your camera on and it says battery exhausted, even though it was cool. You know, Jordan, yeah. let's be honest, your batteries. They're always dead. My battery has never been at 100%. It's that never. Is, yeah, it's never been it, fully charged. I'm usually charging. My camera batteries only get charged in my truck on the way to wherever I'm going. So hopefully it's a long drive. Um, 
and it charges up before then. Um, and my best batteries are Hunter's batteries. Um, yeah, that's... I, buy the, I buy the cheap ones off eBay. Um, that's the Hunter's only the nice. He's got those nice Sony ones and he uh, he labels them for me. That way I know what number they are. It's your, a good problem. It's the only time your battery is fully charged is when you've stolen one from my pack. <laughs> so do you ever do you it's number good, batteries or anything? You, do I what? If you're irresponsible, buy the same camera as your friend because they'll have the same batteries. Do you number batteries or anything to I stay do, organized? Yeah. You do? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so actually, I went to Canada a couple weeks ago, and I think I took either six or eight batteries with me, and I had two like actual just like canon batteries and the rest of my batteries were like yeah off yeah. brand like amazon lithium plus yeah. special well apparently on the airplane ride it like screwed up my batteries so only those two canon batteries would work and would charge so i just like luckily Austin was with me and he had the same camera so we could just like you know i could thieve some batteries off of him but yeah i was out freaking six batteries on that trip yeah but i mean we just it, got home and threw them away that that saved you though in the same token because you knew which two batteries you needed to go to all week or yeah. whatever however long you were there yeah, i knew to never buy be cheap and buy off-brand batteries again hear that jordan take notes <laughs> take. so you talk a lot about traveling on these trips and these hunts um what are some of the cool places that your career has taken you um, what are some of the memorable ones? Because I think that's kind of like we all love photography and anyone who's looking into getting into the field like you have, you know, who's doing it for a love of photography. But, you know, in the outdoor industry, you're also doing it because you love to be outside. And I think kind of the draw to what you do is being able to go on all these hunts and all these trips um, and being able to experience things that, you know, you may not have gotten to do you know, with a nine to five job. Um, so what are kind of some of the cool places you've been and the cool shoots you've been on? And if you want to name drop, you know, who you were shooting for, um, feel free to do that too. Yeah. So, you know, I talked about Maine. Um, that was with Greg when I was filming TV. We went on moose hunt in Maine, you know, and that's like, you know, he had put in for that tag for like 25 years and, we went up there, it was like the f- last week of September, first week of October, like all the leaves were changing and it was just like, it was so sick. And it's like, I'm not a big like moose guy. Like, you know, if you're like, hey, you can go on any hunt you want to, like moose would be pretty low on the list for me. It just like doesn't get me going. But like that hunt was pretty sick. We stayed in a tent. It sucked because it rained for almost every day and it was like miserable. But like that was a cool experience. Didn't kill one, of course. Do you, do you get, so like you said, because like that main hunt, I know it takes a long, like you said, you have to put in points for a very long time. Do you ever get nervous when you're filming somebody who's putting in for a tag for 25 years and you're <laughs> kind of responsible for getting the shot? Um, you know, do you ever feel the pressure of, you know, either making sure the animal is in frame or getting the shot or are you comfortable, you know, telling someone like, that, like, Hey, you know, you got to pass on this. I got to get a better, you know, I need to move or I need to adjust um, kind of how, you know, is that dynamic? Yeah. I mean, it's always nerve wracking whenever, cause it's like, you know, it's just up to you. Like you can't blame it on anybody else, you know, like you either get it or you don't. And like when I first started, you know, like when I filmed T-Bone, you know, like he killed a big deer when I filmed him in, in Kansas. And, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. And I was like, he's like, are you on him? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, I was shaking worse than he was. And I was like, so nervous. And I was like, okay, red lights blinking i'm recording red lights blinking i just like kept looking at it make sure i was recording but, like now i don't get near as nervous but like there is a lot of pressure on you because you know you could not press record your battery could die it could be out of focus it could yeah. be out of frame it's like you know <clears throat> i think it's important too it's like i had worked with greg long enough that like and greg was really good about it like he wouldn't shoot something like till i told him to pretty much um but i like we had worked together enough to know like i i knew when he was going to shoot something so I never luckily had any really bad experiences with him. Um, but yeah, dude, it always kind of gets you worked up. Have you ever had, that's one of my questions here. Has, have you ever screwed up like royally just screwed up for somebody and you know, like forgot to hit record your batteries are dead. Something like that. I want to hear about a time that you screwed up. Knock on wood. I have not, he's not screwed up before. So it's, it's our he's fault. He's a professional, and we are not. Yeah, yeah. I probably just jinxed we myself. But up. Luckily, I we screw not. up all the time. <clears throat> I can't tell you how many times. Well, yeah, not having a battery in your camera, or camera's okay. dead, or I, not hit record. Or I guess I lied. Um, <clears throat> here we go. Yeah, get yourself so, out of this. Yeah, here we go. I uh, so Greg sent me to um, 
a stand on his farm. He's like, hey, he's like, he's pretty much like, go shoot this deer. I was like, okay. He's like, no just, problem. He's like, he's like, just film it. <clears throat> I'm like, all right, whatever. So <clears throat> it like comes out in the field like 150 yards, and I snort wheezed at it. And it just stops and turned and it looked at me and it just turned and just dead sprint right to me. And so I have this Sony FX6, which is a big camera on this giant tree arm. And this deer's running at me and it's like through some brush and I had like one hole to shoot him in. So I just like, I'm like, oh, it looks like it's kind of in focus. So I just manually focused to like that shooting lane, just left my camera there. Dude, that you couldn't even tell if that was a deer or a rabbit. It was so <laughs> out of focus. You literally just see a light and knock fly and hit him. And you're like, oh, did this guy just shoot a bobcat or a deer? Because it was so out of focus. Did he get pissed off? Nah, he didn't care. No, he didn't he was, care. He was like, oh, you Why didn't he come film you? He was hunting for himself. He's just like, my goodness. Just, you, know. you think he could have returned the favor? I know. You know after he did a little film bit. me a few times. Did he? Yeah, he did. I bet that I would so, feel some pressure in that situation. I did. I was like, I, why am I more nervous now than when I'm filming you? Yeah. It's like I'm on so your farm. Have you, kind of circle it back. Where else have you been other than like the main trip? You mentioned uh, antelope hunting in New Mexico, <clears throat> uh, duck hunting in Canada. Yeah. So I've been to Maine. Um, I've been to Canada, New Mexico. Been to New Mexico twice. I've been to Utah been to wyoming um i've been to virginia obviously been to iowa kansas um you about checked them all off colorado yeah, been, you went there too didn't colorado, you? colorado yeah you're gonna um, come there next year from what i hear to help us hunt and film <laughs> you don't want me to help you hunt i might help you film but you don't want me to help you hunt. well we'll take that deal too <laughs> um when you're when you were in new mexico you said you were filming antelope yeah was that a rifle or was that a uh, archery hunt? That was a bow tag, and it was like, Ooh. you know, I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. We're going to go sit on a water hole. Oh, We're going to shoot an antelope like day one. That's what I would <clears> Well, think. they had so much rain out there when I went that like they had no reason to go to water holes. And <laughs> all we were hunting was just straight tilled up dirt fields. So we were just trying to like stalk these antelope behind decoys. And long story short, we never even got close to one. It was like a... It was a They're hard insane, hunt. Like yeah. how good their eyes are. Like it's, it's, <clears throat> I couldn't imagine because in Colorado you can hunt them um, with your bow. And like, I knew guys who did it and I was like, there's no way, like I, I love archery hunting, but that's one animal that I wouldn't even, wouldn't even attempt it. Like it, it's so hard to get close to them with a rifle, like a high powered rifle that I, they're just, there's no way I would even attempt to archery hunt that. Yeah. And like we were, you know, we were sneaking up on these antelope behind decoys and, is like we had a cameraman and you had a hunter and you know to try to get like the level of production that we were trying to get out of it's like i'm lugging this giant fx6 after these antelope on a tripod and just we would get to like 150 200 yards and they're just be like yeah i'm out of here you know like we couldn't hide and it was it was a tough hunt what's one hunt that you have filmed you know for somebody else that you would you know want to go on yourself <clears throat> like if you could go back and do it yeah so i went to utah in september this past september on an elk hunt and a place called the deseret and dude, it was like jurassic park you know like when you're turkey hunting and you like you know you're in a big group of birds and you like park the truck and you get out and it's dark and it's just like all around you they're just gobbling that's like what it was like with elk it's like you got out of the truck in the morning and it's just everywhere around you it's like oh which one do we want to go after yeah and all day long, like daylight to dark, it was just bugles and encounters and bulls coming in. And it was like, that's the first elk hunt I'd ever been on. And dude, it like spoiled me. It's like, oh, I'm not you going. Ruined, you ruined, you yes, ruined yourself. Exactly. Was that a limited, was that a public land hunt? No, no, it was a, it was a private okay. land hunt. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, we hear some of that though, too. It gets going pretty good depending on the weather and the yeah. time of the year. But I mean, you will hear them. It's probably not the same caliber that you were seeing, but you would hear them. Um, I don't, I don't mean to circle back too far here, but we've got a question that actually came in from Instagram, uh, from Clayton and he wants to know what your take is on freelancing and making a career in the outdoor industry and basically just what are some of the pros and cons of what you do? Yeah. So <clears throat> like for me personally, you know, the freelance route, you know, like if I wanted to go make a living freelancing, could I do it? Maybe. I don't, I don't know. Cause I've never like tried. <clears throat> um, but you know, I couldn't imagine 
doing what I do now and having the workload I have now and also trying to be a business owner and get clients and figure out where my next paycheck's coming from. And that's like one thing that I like about what I do is, you know, I know I'm going to get paid every two weeks. I know I'm going to constantly have work. I don't have to worry about, oh, am I not going to have a project or anything in the next three weeks and not get a paycheck? That's like the worst thing about freelancing. And, you know, I, I think that if you have the work ethic to do it, and like you're willing to take risk and you're not afraid of that stuff, then like go that route for sure. Um, <clears throat> as far as like pros and cons of, of what I do, I say there's a lot of both. I mean, you know, obviously the pros like we've been talking about is I've got to see things and do things that I would never get to do or like never be able to afford to do. Like if I didn't do like, you know, what I do now, you know, and like we were talking about earlier too, you know, I bet I've met some of my best friends through what I do through work. And, you know, I talk to more people through Instagram that I met on social media or that I met on a shoot than I do that I went to high school with that I know. And, you know, the people that we work with every day, it's like, <clears throat> you know, we're a small team at, at Collectus and like those dudes are like my buddies, you know, it's like, it doesn't feel like work. You know, I like, I wake up every day and it's like, your boss calls you and most people are like, ah, boss is calling me. You know, it's like my boss calls me and like we BS for 30 minutes before we even talk about what we need to talk so about. Is that basically, is that like a remote? Yeah. So at I work times remote, yeah. and then you guys go, <clears throat> when you have a project to come up, you get together, collaborate, go do the shoot and then come back and split up, edit, do whatever you need to do. You yeah. Know, make I mean, phone it's just, calls. yeah, it's just shoot dependent. Um, I mean, we spend a lot of time on, on Google meet and Microsoft teams having meetings, you know, internally and with clients, but there's times where we'll be on shoots together. Like when I went to Canada, like we're me and Austin were together. Um, but then, you know, like last week I was, uh, I was on a shoot, um, by myself and then there's Austin was on a shoot by himself last week. So just kind of depends on the shoot and you know, if it's just photo, if it's photo video, if it's a big video project, it kind of just depends. Um, and then usually one of us will handle the edits, you know, like we had a lot of video projects that we shot in Canada. Um, that I've got to turn around here pretty quickly. And, um, it's like, I'm handling those. Um, he's handling like, like two of them. We had like nine videos to do from that trip. But so it's just kind of dependent on, on the clients once and, and what we do. Are most of the deadlines like a year, are they year out? Are they a week, two yeah, weeks? So it's really dependent. Um, holiday season, stuff like that, trying to get promotions out as far as... Yeah, it's either, it seems like it's either a year or like a week. Okay, um, yeah. Yeah. There's it, no in-between. No, very rarely is there an in-between. So I guess so that like, would hey, be... hey, you need to turn this around ASAP or, hey, this is not due until yeah. next November. And I, I guess one last question on that before we move on, and I think this is the big one that everyone wants to know. Is there enough money? What's the money like as far as... Can you give us a range... For somebody like top of the line, mid level, sal is it salary? Like, how does that work? Because I know a lot of people probably are comparing, you know, going to work full time versus going out and doing this this other thing, and and they're wanting to know because overall that is a big factor for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> it, I mean, it's is it something that you're definitely doing it for the love first, and then the money comes with it. And it's pretty good, or is it something that the money and the love can both be there. Yeah. I mean, for me, um, you know, like with what I went to school for the, like when I interned with that construction company, like they offered me a job coming out of college and full benefits, salary. And when Greg offered me a job, Greg offered me more money with benefits. Really? Than, yeah, I, than see, I would have never expected that. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. And it's like, <clears throat> you know, people think, oh, you don't make that much money because you're a photographer. And <clears throat> it's like, you know, photography and videography is not all that we do like there's more money in it in digital media as a whole than people think you just have to get with the right brands and the right companies I and mean, it's all about budgets the bigger the brand the bigger their budget and you know i'm not gonna say like what i make but you know i would say you know like when somebody starts if you go work for an agency you know you might start out at 40 grand, but you have the opportunity to make 150 grand. Wow. So that's it, pretty, that's a high, that's higher than I ever would have expected yeah, on the and, top end. You know, when I was like first getting into it, that was like one of my concerns was like, you know, oh, I'm not going to make that much money. It's like, 
yeah, I'm right. gonna have a job that I enjoy, but I'm not gonna make that much money. And well, I quickly realized that like there's a lot more money in the outdoor industry than people think. Um, you know, I think you could argue now that this is the best time ever to be hundred percent to be yeah. born to to want to do this because we have so many different avenues that we could go down, and it's never been more popular to be an influencer post content like we're constantly you got new apps out all the time that you don't yeah. know what the next big thing is so i mean it's a great time to be in it and just hearing you talk about mention you know over forty thousand dollars i mean i don't i don't know what i was thinking i was thinking probably 40 to 50 to 60 somewhere yeah, in that range most people think yeah so hearing someone you know at the top 150 or so that's it's pretty intriguing for a lot of people i feel like yeah. So you, you talked about some of the companies you had, you know, you said, you know, the bigger the company, the bigger the budget. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there who, you know, they have their favorite company, um, especially like, you know, guys in general, I think we're very brand, you know, brand dependent, you know, you either drive a Chevy or a Ford or, you know, you yeah. either love Sitka or you're, you know, you're a whatever, a QU guy or um, how do you, you know, go about, you know, if you're starting off or even you like getting a shoot with Matthews or getting a shoot with Sitka or, you know, I know you've worked with a lot of big companies. Is that something that, you know, they reach out to you? Um, you know, if you were getting started off, is that something where, you know, you're just taking a lot of photos, you know, with those products and then, you know, they take notice of you doing that? Because I think you see it a lot in the industry, people on Instagram or whatever, where they're like, hey, you know, I love this brand. So I'm going to take a bunch of photos of me with this brand. And it almost becomes like a, you know, they're, they're influencing for the brand or they're promoting the brand, you know, maybe in an unofficial capacity, hoping to at some point take that on as an official role. Um, kind of what's your you know take on that and how to go about it? Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> like for me and working like for an agency, like the opportunities that I have are like because of our agency, but you know, like our agency was started by Austin and like Austin had to get those clients, you know, and you know, he always tells me this too. It's like, you have to work for free for those clients for so long before you come noticed. And, you know, it's like, I didn't, I never did anything with some of these brands like before him, but like I was trying to, you know, and it's just, you know, I would spend so much time. Like I was gone. I traveled a lot when I worked in TV and when I was home, you know, I was like, Oh, I want to hunt for myself. But it was like, I would still take some of the time that I had to hunt for myself and use it as an opportunity to just go create content for myself for some of these brands for free. You know, I mean, whether it was like I had a just use Matthews for an example, like whether I had a bow or my brother had a bow, like just trying to create a portfolio for those brands is be like, hey, this is what I can do, you know, and you know, you have to do it for free for so long. But once you build a relationship with them, yeah. that's the biggest thing. You I just can, have to build a relationship with them. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you have to be good, but, you know, a brand would rather have somebody they're buddies with and they like that has good content versus somebody they don't really know that has great content. I I 100% can see what he's saying from the outside perspective, because I feel like there's there's times where we might have shared a photo and it's like, we're sitting here like, man, this photo's got everything. It's one of the best we've ever taken. And then here we go. We've got this company posting this guy's photo. And it's, it's not even, it's in the same ballpark, but we felt like ours was better. And it's like, yeah, well, this guy's tied in with him. So it's kind of, I guess there is, it goes back to the networking thing. 100%. Really, like, I mean, you could get on Instagram right now and, you know, I could pull up my phone and go to Instagram and I could find a hundred photographers that are better than me that don't work for any of the brands that I do just because they have no relationship with them. And, you know, there's so many people out there that are way more talented than me from the photo and video side, but you just have to build a network and make the right connections. And, you know, like for me with what I do now, like obviously Austin is like the reason I have those connections, but like if I wouldn't have, have reached out to Austin, you know, as a scared little kid seven years ago and just became buddies with him, like I'd have never had those opportunities now. Yeah, I mean, you got to think on their terms too, as far as the, their businesses. These big companies are getting flooded with people probably emailing them, 
and sending them direct messages and tagging them and stuff and all, you know, they don't have somebody going through that probably all day long. And so I, you're definitely at an advantage. I can see what you're saying there, but yeah, if we want to dive back into, you know, some more of the X's and O's. So you said you're running a, a, can, a Canon right now. What model was that again? An R5. An R5. Yeah. So that's like your go-to. Yeah. So that's my main photo camera. And yeah. do you, do you carry more than one body with you depending on the say you're going out to shoot uh, some photos for some company are you going to be you're going to have two or three cameras strapped to you and multiple lenses what does that setup kind of look like yeah so it just like depends on the shoot um you know if i'm on an actual hunt like this elk hunt for example that i was on you know we're away from the lodge all day so i had two camera bodies and like four lenses and you know too many batteries and too many sd cards but you know i just I have the opportunity with like what we do now that I can work out my back door a lot. I can just walk out my back door and go shoot, shoot photos for a client. And you know, when I do that, I'll usually, I'll usually just run mainly one body and then I'll just take, you know, <clears throat> one or two more lenses really just depends. But a lot of times I do keep two bodies on me and you know, a lot of times that's more just for if something happens, especially when you're on a hunt, always just having a backup body. So that way, you know, I'm hard on my stuff. I drop it out of the tree. and So you don't necessarily have like one photo or one camera set up with a mm -hmm. wide angle lens and then one with a telephoto lens. Or do you ever use that to your advantage where you have two setups and you can grab one or the other? Yeah, so like that elk hunt, what I did was I had, I ran like a peak design strap on my backpack and I had like my main body um, with a 35 millimeter lens and I had a peak design like strap on my other camera and I had a 70 to 200 on it. So that trip was like photo and video. So I had, <clears throat> um, and like we were gone and running and gunning. So I was just filming with my R5 too. And I would, uh, I would keep the 70 to 200 like, around my neck for any like elk encounters and then i would i would use my camera that was on my chest for just b-roll and photos and, and things of that nature so what would be your all-time favorite lens if you had to pick one i mean <laughs> say you're gonna go you're gonna go film a deer hunt for somebody and there's also the opportunity that at the end of it you have to take the trophy pictures at the end <laughs> what's the one lens that you're grabbing out of your bag so from a photo standpoint i would say 75 to 80 percent of what i shoot is on a 35 millimeter one four and everything and 12 percent is on a 70 to 200 <clears throat> and the rest is either on like 24 to 70 a macro lens or like a super wide like 14 millimeter um but yeah a 35 is like that's my go-to lens like i i couldn't tell you the last time i didn't have a 35 on my camera on one of them is that more photography or do you, do you still do a lot of video? With I still it? do a lot of video with video. it too. Yeah. <clears throat> for, for photo, for sure. I do. Um, if I'm, if I'm strictly on a video shoot, I still like prime lenses, but I'll run the 24 to 70 a lot too. So the, the big advantage of that 35, is it because it can, it can shoot a 1.4 and just for people that aren't watching the 1.4 basically allows you to get that depth of field and Correct. a lot yeah. more light in there and get, <laughs> you know, those macro shots at times that you've got all that detail in your photos. So that's basically the gist of that lens is that's its sweet spot. Is that what you would say? Or would you say that it's more versatile than just the, the macros and yeah, I mean, it's just more versatile and like <clears throat> 35 millimeters, like what your eye sees. So it's just like natural to what you're seeing. And, you know, being a one, four, like, you know, you can, I try not to shoot wide open at one four much, but you know, you shoot at <clears throat> one eight or one six or even like F2, you get a, a shallower depth of field and like a two eight on a 70 to 200 or 24 to 70. I think it just creates a better image and it just gives a better perspective. Let your subject pop. You get some bokeh around your subject if you have the right light. And I just like the look of prime lenses better. Um, I used to shoot on a 50 millimeter a lot. And then when I started shooting on a 35, I just kind of quit, but it was the same with the 50. It just, produces a better image in my opinion and you say you don't you don't tend to stay on the one four that's because <laughs> you're not wanting to miss things and get them out of focus whereas you know you go up an aperture and you can actually expand that focus or yeah the focal point <clears throat> yeah i mean shooting at, at one four you know especially if you're 
running manual focus for video or something um or even photo it's just so finicky and you can miss it so easy and <clears throat> from a photo side too you know shooting wide open at, at one four you get some chromatic aberration which is for those that don't know it's just like you get some magentas like around your subject or like around your background and if you shoot a little more open at you know one eight or two that that kind of goes away and just creates a sharper look than, than shooting wide open I see. yeah I see. so <clears throat> Are those prime lenses? Are they? Do they have the capability of autofocus and manual focus? And yeah. like, what? What are you typically? Are you using manual focus most of the time, or do you, you know, depending? Does it depend on the work you're doing where you can go and trust autofocus? Yeah. So <clears throat> it really just depends on what I'm doing. From a photo standpoint, I run autofocus ninety percent of the time. Um, <clears throat> just to give an example of like my workflow with my camera is like on my R5, you know. I hit one button and my focus ring will pop up and then there's a thumb switch that I can just toggle that autofocus wherever I want to and just set that focal point. Um, so it's just quicker for me to do that. And I know I'm sharp versus trying to manually focus, especially if I'm shooting something that's moving, you know, like I shoot a lot of dogs with ducks and like trying to shoot those manual is just like nearly impossible. And, you know, having an autofocus setting where it can track too, and you can just get constant sharp photos is a huge deal. And that's like what I like so much about that camera is just the ability to, to change that focal point. But if I'm running video, I'm running manual <clears throat> probably 90% of the time. Um, just so that way my autofocus doesn't breathe and focus on something else. And, you know, I'll have my peaking on so I can tell that's what's what in focus. Was, that's yeah. what I was getting yeah. to ask. Yeah. Um, have you noticed a difference as far as uh, with Sony versus Canon on, <laughs> like you said, you, you can pick out your focal point. I believe that the same thing that you're talking about, I've done before. Um, it's like you can pick the center of the lens or you can pick wide. You can pick several yeah. different options. <clears throat> I still feel like my camera does not do a very good job at it. Now, I don't know whether it's because of the lens I have on at the time. I actually have like a 200 to 600 lens, which yeah. is a, it's an absolute giant. <clears throat> so maybe that has something to do with it. But have you noticed the differences between like camera with Sony and, and Canon as far as yeah, for sure. autofocus goes? Yeah, so like when I was running the FX6 and the A7S III, that was mainly for video and I would still shoot photos on my R5. Um, like the video quality on the R5 versus like the A7S three, cause they're like comparable models. The video quality on the S three is just so much better, but the photo capabilities and quality on the R5 are so much better in my opinion. I mean, that's not that's, factual. That's, that's, act, that's, no, that's good to hear. But I believe it. <clears throat> like on the video side, working with Sony, like S log three, video versus like Canon C log, you can just color S log so much better and you have so much more dynamic range. And from a photo side, like the color on a Canon is just so much crisper and creamier and you just have more to work with. I feel like in post-production with a Canon versus a Sony. And, you know, I'm sure there was a way, but like when I ran the, the S3 for, for photos, cause I did shoot a lot of photos on it still, just so I didn't have to carry another body. Um, it was like my workflow on my R5 just like ergonomically was just so much better. It was just so much easier to just focus quicker and it just felt better in the hand and I could just run through the settings so much better and just quicker. And like with what I do, like I don't have time to fiddle around with settings. I got to be pretty quick, you know? So that's like, that was my workflow like for the, the Canon versus Sony. But yeah, the R5 from a photo side is definitely stronger, but the S3 was way better on the video side. When you, you mentioned something about the S log, is that the mm -hmm. picture profile that basically it shoots in and that's, yeah. you're wanting like a really simple blank canvas to start with. That way you can do all your post-processing work without having to alter. You don't want something to be too colorful coming right mm -hmm. off the camera. That yeah. way you can have more control in the post-processing. Yeah, so from a video side, like S log three, a log profile is, you know, when you shoot in a log profile, it's essentially like all your information is stored in there and it's essentially like a gray image. Yeah. And, you know, you just have so much more control over it in post-production and you can just manipulate it to look however you want versus if you shoot in like a, a color profile, you know, like when I shot on the FX6, sometimes I would shoot in a color profile called Cinetone and like the, the skin tones in log versus like Cinetone, like you could just control so much better with like if you're in a dark situation and I would shoot in Cinetone because you can't, you don't have as much control over the light and like skin tones would look better, but like on a bright day or 
you know, like we were hunting all day most of the time, you know, and shooting video stuff and, and S log like midday and just having the control over that and being able to get your skin tones to look right and you can manipulate every color and getting your exposure to look good and your shadows. It's just so much easier to do on the Sony versus the Canon. The Canon log isn't as as flat of a look. It's got a little bit of, you know, contrast and, and color to it <clears throat> and you lose a little bit of control. You can still get it to look good, but the Sony S log is just so much better to work with. Does that kind of tie into shooting when we, we go back to photography here, a raw versus JPEG? Are you yeah. always shooting in raw? <clears throat> yeah, hundred percent of the time I'm shooting in raw. Do you ever do both raw plus JPEG? I do not. It fills, I, it fills up the card. Dude, really I am so heavy on the shutter that I would need like a hundred terabyte freaking SD cards if well, I before we get out of this, do you um like your drive mode on the camera, mm -hmm. do you have that high speed continuous? High speed continuous, yes. and you just got your finger down. So, to give you some context on this, I just went on a two day shoot for a client. Twenty nine thousand five hundred seventy two photos is what I imported in the Lightroom when I got back on two days. That's a lot. That's how do you even? I mean, when okay, we can get into kind of the post processing <laughs> side of it. Do you use Lightroom? Is that I what do, you're yeah. in? Yeah. How do you? start to pick out your better photo how do you separate some of the photos is it a quick a quick scan down through and then you just go for something that catches your eye or do you have something in mind from when you shot it yeah so i'll import all the photos into <clears throat> into lightroom and then i'll go through literally every photo so that's like what that's like what i did today actually was i went through um all 27 or 29,000 of those and, and he doesn't drink coffee can you I believe don't that drink coffee i'm just built off mountain dew and pre-workout he's got a mountain dew here so <laughs> yeah what do you get is that a big gulp it is dude absolutely what's in it mountain, mountain dew, dew. Oh, okay. the sick. next podcast sponsor maybe that'd be sick if we can get him you know he might network for us since we're, we suck at it so much but i did too but <clears throat> so uh, how do you how do you pick out those yeah so i'll go through every photo and if i like want to keep it edit it uh, like i call it selects like in in lightroom i have it set up to where <clears throat> if i hit b on my keyboard it'll add it to a quick collection so like I have, when you import all your photos in the Lightroom, it'll be like all photographs. And over on the side, you'll have like quick collection. And if you just hit B on your keyboard, it'll add it to a quick collection. And then, so I'll go through them all, make selects, and then start the edit process from that quick collection. So, you know, I think I ended up with like, I don't know, 2,400 selects out of like the 29,000. So, yeah. So that's, like, that's like what, 1%? Or yeah, like dude, it's a, I don't even know, yeah. but it's a terrible ratio. It's like... I'm just unnecessarily holding down that shutter button, but there's a lot of like dogs and there's a lot of flying ducks. So that's like my excuse. Is to so add after many. you've selected those photos and you really yeah. want to go into detail on one of them, do you typically, have you made your own presets or do you pick something out off of, I know there's like premium, they've got all sorts of different options on there as far as like you can apply a, this look to it and then you can go in and adjust or do you start from scratch, totally blank slate, and just go in, mess with exposure, contrast, yeah, <laughs> highlight shadows? Yeah, What's so your it process? Just, it really just depends, like where I'm at and what I'm shooting. Like I have presets built out for almost like every condition and like every location. You know, like I have a, you know, I literally have a preset now called like Utah Elk, and so like that would be my base preset for every photo when I was out there, um, but you know, colors change and where you're at changes. So I would manipulate it based off, but it would be based off that preset just to have a consistency. Um, and then, you know, <clears throat> like shooting something now, you have no leaves on the trees. It's just a lot of bright sky and not much color. So like I'll have, you know, like a late season preset. I'll have like an early season preset that's got, you know, makes your greens look good in early season, but like now there's no greens anywhere. So I'm not going to use that preset, but I usually, I'll usually have a preset that's fairly close and then I'll just tweak it from there. But sometimes I will start from scratch. Like, you know, the, the Utah shoot I went on, like I, I had never been in that, like the Aspens before and shot things. So I like started from scratch with that. So I'll, I'll say one of my biggest questions, I guess, coming into this tonight was, are you somebody that's looking at the big picture on your Instagram profile grid, because 
last night I'm scrolling through looking at your your grid and it's just it's one of the most professional looking profiles you can ever see because you're not mixing it's like you run with you run with a look for so long and then it's almost like you're transitioning out of it into a new look so it's like it's an aesthetic yeah it's very it's very consistent too it's not like we do we do a really bad job because we're involved in so many different aspects that like, like for one, we'll, we'll be posting this video. Well, this is hard to mix with a picture right. that's shot in the fall and make it look aesthetically pleasing. So yeah, are you planning, are you planning your layout or is it something that you look like three photos ahead or do you have 10 photos and you're like, all right, I'm going to post them in this order because this is going to make my profile look it's going to separate it because your profile does look, it looks way better than any of ours. <laughs> well, at least somebody likes it. Um, I, I don't know how you couldn't. I think it's <laughs> it's good as it gets, honestly. Yeah. So like <clears throat> from like my personal Instagram, like I don't, like I want it to look good, but like I don't like think too much about it. I just be like, oh, I want to post this photo and like I'll post it. But you know, like if it was a client, like, yeah, that's super important. Like, oh, this needs to look good. And like, oh, these two photos are too similar. And so it's like a lot bigger deal when it's like for a client versus like for myself. Um, and you know, like we were talking about earlier, like <clears throat> I truthfully, like if you go on my Instagram now, like there's no, I don't post hardly any like legitimate work on there. Like I haven't posted anything that I shot this year that was like actual work. It was just like, you know, Oh, I went duck hunting with my buddies or, <clears throat> Oh, I, you know, shot some drone shots of, my uncle farming. It was just stuff like that. Like I don't really post a ton of, of actual work on my Instagram, which because I can't, yeah, cause off. you know, we're shooting product stuff from, you know, <clears throat> that's not released yet. Like a lot of my Instagram is just like photos that, you know, I took that aren't work or like a lot of photos of like me with deer and me with turkeys and, and things of that nature i'll just say if you if you're not playing that out you're doing a really good job of just randomly making it look organized because it it literally has a feel to it that it's it's on purpose if that makes sense um, but maybe i'll put a little more thought into it now. <laughs> i don't think you should i think you should just continue with what you're doing because it's it's working for you so I've pulled up uh, a few for those people on Spotify. If you're listening, we've pulled up Blake's Instagram here. You can search him at Blake dot um, on Instagram. You can see this first shot here. We'll get into this in a minute. He's obviously not only good behind the camera. He's, he's, uh, you know, you're a slayer when it comes to deer apparently. So I did not know that either until last night. I, I knew you had some of those big ones, but when I put that little picture together, I was like, Oh crap. Yeah, good. The, the like less it. that people know, the better. <laughs> it's like, you know, I killed two deer this year and like nobody knows. Yeah. It's like, I don't really want people to know anymore. So like you know? if, if we look at these two photos, I just pulled these, uh, I snipped them from your, your page. So don't give me any lawsuits or anything <laughs> coming in yeah, the mail. Copyright infringement. Yeah. But like, I'll just point out a few things that I notice in, in these pictures that are awesome. I think like the picture on the left, just just the lighting itself is what makes the photo. And obviously, you've got a pretty good buck standing there. I mean, that's yeah. that's a big part of it. And then the picture on the right, we discussed this before we, we came on live. I thought that you had messed with the top half of the photo and drug like a, a gradient or something over it to kind of diffuse that light and make it a little bit brighter. But Jordan, that's actual natural lighting. Would you would you agree? Would you think that that was something that was touched up? Yeah, I mean, it definitely looks. I mean, it. it yeah, like I would agree. I like I, I can't decide that if, that if that's a, you know, a, you a good add, thing or a bad you know, thing. Like really, um, I think it's a. But good... I think that's just like if you're a good, you know, if you know what you're doing, if you're a good photographer, like you know, you kind of find those, you, you know. Yeah, I you mean, find you... your light. You were able to, I don't know how many, you probably didn't take 29,000 pictures on no, that. No, but I took plenty. Yeah, but like you were able to pick that out probably pretty quickly as far as that one caught your eye. So you've definitely got an eye for it. And then we can move on to this one. This was, is it Diverge 11? 10? Um, one of those? It was 9 or 10, I nine think. 9 or 10. Yeah. So this one was an award winner. Yeah. <clears throat> did, you, did you win? No, you... it was in the finals, but I did not win. Nice. We got multiple, multiple have, Diverge. Yeah finalist in the it's basement cool. <laughs> it is cool and you you i don't know you have a chance Who? you you had that one you photo got a that, chance jordan 
they did post they did post that one, but I haven't even I haven't checked to see. I don't know when they do the actual it's Nikos. Uh, like when they when they select them. I thought it was like right now though. It'll be uh, it'll be fairly quickly. Nico's next on this. Yeah. So, but I mean they they posted it and they said like divert, you know, whatever, and they messaged me and asked if they could like use it. And yeah. I was like, Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping that I made it just because I don't like Hunter having that <laughs> over me. I would like to at least get picked though. I can be like, well, yeah, I did it too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, either way. So let's dive into this photo a little bit more since it was an award winner. Yep. Um, so you're using some light painting on this. Um, yeah, just, just break this down a little bit better for us, for those at home that, that don't know much about that process. Like if you don't mind, how did you, how did you get the streaks? Um, in the shot as far as that's a headlamp, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is a photo of, um, of my brother putting like his hunting clothes, you know, he just washed them and he's putting them on, on the, <clears throat> the clothesline, um, obviously in the dark and he's got a headlamp on and I shot that on a tripod and the light streaks come from my shutter speed. And, <clears throat> you know, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I would say it was probably, it's probably like one fifth or oh, it was, less it than was, that. Yeah, it was even a less. A couple than that. seconds. It was like ten or fifteen seconds. Wow. I think. Maybe yeah. even a little longer than that. It could have even been thirty, for all I remember. Yeah. Um, it feels so long ago now, but <laughs> yeah. And it's like <clears throat> that's a prime example of like I would have never known how people got those photos if I wouldn't have asked people. Yeah. You know? like, I think I figured out how to do that on YouTube. But yeah. It took yeah. it took a lot of searching. Yeah, because it's like you know I would be like, oh, I don't know how to Google like what this photo looks what like is now. this you don't like, know what light does this well, photo what, have lights it takes in so it. long like yeah. to take those long exposure shots that like you like i know i when i first started i would just get so frustrated because i'm like a very like i don't have the patience that you take it takes you so long as you said it takes 30 seconds to take that shot and then it takes another two minutes to process uh, it least on my camera to process it so it's like you can only take a photo every two three four minutes and it's a patience um, it's game dark out, so, yeah you know I'm, I'm always guessing. And after so many minutes, I just give up. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, like, good. I'm going back inside. <laughs> Would you agree that that's, that's a stability important photo as far as you either have to be on a tripod, you have to have the shutter timed. You don't want to be mm -hmm. touching the, the shutter on that one and rocking the camera. Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> like, I know when I shot that, like it was on a tripod and I had it on a three second timer. Um, so press the shutter button and then three Counts seconds later starts taking the photo yeah. and i just did that so there was no shake or anything um because obviously like that photo's not what you're looking at you know yeah. and it takes a while to take that photo so just being stable you know like you can never freehand that photo and then there's it looks like at the end of the photo potentially you had him maybe turn the headlamp down at the the bag that's on the ground and add some light in there yeah so I, that's just him like <clears throat> so he had like two jackets in his arm and like hung two up and then um, like hung them up on the end and then just walked back and then was in the process of just like pulling out more jackets. Um, so that no, wasn't necessarily planned in that case, yeah, but yeah, but you could, you could literally paint it in there if you wanted the light. Yeah. So was there a lot of editing on that photo or is it pretty? Not really. Um, I don't edit my photos at night a ton. Yeah. Um, a little bit, but, but not a lot. There's was there, just... was there ever a part of you um, on this photo that you're like, you know what? This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like behind it, that we've got this these clothes strung out in the dark. Like, <laughs> what time of the year was this even taken? It was pretty late. It was like it was November, pretty, so yeah. it was pretty cold outside. So yeah, you probably wouldn't have been doing this actually. Like without, it was almost a stage photo, if that makes sense. Or were yeah, you no, actually? It was actually a legit photo. Like he had just like he was about so, to um, go so on you, vacation for work, and he's like, oh, "I gotta wash my hunting clothes." Okay. And so you were actually. That was actually in the heat of the moment. Yeah. Okay. And, but yes, like to your point, like I remember, you know, actually like with that Diverge contest, you like weekly giveaways and actually like my boss now, Austin, like picked that photo for like a weekly giveaway. And I remember when he did, <clears throat> my mom was like, she's like, I don't really like understand what's going on. Here. <laughs> and, but like, that's just what you just have to look for in our industry now to stand out. It's just abstract things like, you know, I've never seen a photo like that before. Yeah. And there's there, is there a part of you that, so I'm sure you, you do a lot of scrolling like the rest of us and you see other people's photos and you get inspiration from them. Is there part of you that 
you try to shy away from copying them. Like you're obviously not intentionally copying what they do, but like you want to, you want to go out and be proactive and get ideas from other people. But at the same time, you don't want to like go out there and just, it'd be like me taking this photo tonight and posting it and being like, ah, I just had this really great idea after the podcast tonight. And right. you know, is there ever something in there that like you shy away from posting a photo because you've seen it on somebody else's page? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, you know, truthfully, like when I was starting, like I would screenshot people's Instagram posts and be like, oh, I'm going to go try to manipulate this photo because it's like, a good way to learn. Yeah, sure. that's all it was. Doing. I was just trying to figure out, you know, how they did it. And, you know, rarely did it ever work out. But <laughs> and then you're like, oh, crap. And I'm like, wow, same photo. Suck. <laughs> yeah. And then you take it and you're like, oh, it's the same photo. But like mine's not near as good. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a part of artificial we talk a lot about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. nowadays and i know there's a lot like lightroom they just brought a, a bunch of like ai tools in that you can really clean things up with is there a part of you that worries of you know where this is headed with ai and is it is it going to take some of the the skill out of the game like how are you going to continue to separate your work from somebody that's literally just sitting behind a computer clicking a few buttons and then spitting out this beautiful image yeah i mean i'm not as worried about it on the photo side as the video side because there will be a point i think in our lifetime where you can import all your footage into a timeline and i think you can like type in what you want to see and it'll just the computer will just auto generate it and spit it back out to you and so i'm more worried about it from a, a video side than a photo side um I mean, from a photo side, I think just <clears throat> trying to shoot authentic imagery, like, you know, with what I do now is, you know, I don't shoot, I don't shoot a ton of like actual hunts anymore. It's just more like content trips and, and, you know, set up photo shoots, if you will. And, but just trying to make that look authentic as possible and like capturing things that like, you know, most people won't like <clears throat> one of my favorite photos I've taken this year is. When I was in Virginia, um, my buddy shot a doe and we took it to this meat locker and this dude, like he was inside and he's like, he's like, yeah, I'll meet you out back. So <clears throat> we drive around out back and he pulls around the corner and he's wearing bib overalls, an apron, like a bloody, like butcher's apron. And he's like smoking this giant cigar <laughs> and he's just like an epic looking individual. It sounds like a shirt we need to come out with or a yeah, sticker. If you can send me the picture of that guy. And it's like he, he was driving a lawnmower with a little oh. like trailer on the back of it to like put this deer in. And it's like, you know, most people aren't going to photo that. But me, I was like, I was just ripping the shutter, dude. Like, my buddy was throwing that deer in there. It's like one of the most epic photos I've ever taken. I believe it. It was just a sick place. It's like you walked in and there was, you know, an old photo wall of just like deer that people had killed. And just like trying to shoot, you know, things that aren't necessarily like hunt related, but like still tell yeah, the story of a hunt. Right. You're yeah. telling a story in a lot of your photos, whereas yeah. you're a lot of people are just going out there and clicking the button over and yeah. over. And like, man, that looks cool. Let me do it again. Yep. So, no, that's that's really cool. I can go ahead and dive back into some of these uh, photos. This is actually this is one of my favorites right here, and it's got it's got a little bit of motion to it too, wouldn't you say? Like it does, maybe yeah. a, a shutter speed that was a little bit slower than yeah. It was probably normal. when I shoot motion blur stuff, I'm usually shooting at like one thirtieth. Um, you you know, sometimes a, slower, sometimes faster. You but. have an ND filter on there too. I do most of the time, yeah. So, now, like, was the goal here to not get the bloody ducks in the truck? <laughs> yes and no. It's just you got to do some things for the photo. Yeah, I, I like to imagine that like this was you know your truck was broke down, and this was like your wife's car or like your girlfriend. She's like, you could take it, but like hey. don't get any blood. If your don't wife get any blood, in. dude. If you're, so you're like, yeah. all right, we, we, we won't. If your girlfriend yeah. has a lifted like we got SUV choose. with tractor tires on it, that screams meth head. Yeah, and you steal it to go shoot ducks and <laughs> drive through the water, you got to keep her. Do you see a lot of that rolling around in Woodlawn? More than I would like to admit. <laughs> Did you see any of that yeah, on the way here in Johnson City? I love surprisingly. The, I love photo because of the like you guys said the storytelling. Like it reminds me of like when we were in high school and we used to take we had a Tahoe and we would take it 
to Cash River or like the Ohio River, and we would just, just like drive it through that the thing out. Like that's just like that's it. what it reminds me of. So I think that's why, like, I love that photo because it just. What the hell are you actually like driving on? Is, is there pavement underneath that? No, that's just like that's, that's the middle of a flooded like millet field. Why is it so like? How do you have the ability to not? Dude, we drove. We're like a mile from like a dirt road, so we like <clears throat> went down a dirt road. Turned on this levee, and then there was just a flooded field, and we just took that thing straight across it. Those are like front tire tractors off of like a Massey Ferguson like roll guard tractor. You guys never did you do like a feeler though? You're like out there walking around, stomping around, making sure it, was, it feels solid. It was pretty solid. We would just like kind of creep forward, and then we're like, ah, we got <laughs> too far to go. We're just gonna send it. Let's send it. We can total it. It probably wouldn't cost too much. Yeah. Things just screaming too. Yeah. So these are a couple more photos that I've pulled out. Like the photo really, both of these really jump out to me. Just, I don't know the one on the right. I don't feel like there's anything that special to it other than yeah, just that tree in the center of it and the guy climbing. I mean, it just, that's something that I feel like at times I've passed up. Like I've taken a photo like that and then <laughs> I've not posted it either because I, I see the full frame of it. I'm like, man, some of it's out of focus or like, there's just some, I look at it too long. I'm the I, same way. I nitpick it, and yeah. I'm like, and I'm like, I'm super hard on myself. And it's like I'll go shoot a photo guy, and I'm like, oh, this is so bad. And we'll like send it to the client, and be like, oh, sick. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe it is. Yeah, good. yeah. So I, de I definitely think you can uh, appeal to other people's eyes. So it is good. Do you ever like go out and send? Do you send a photo of yours before you post it to two or three different people? And you're like, what do you think of this? Sometimes, yeah. Probably like, not this much photo any good. You already not, know, yeah. but. So the the photo on the left, um, that would obviously be taken with something with a higher shutter speed, so that you can, yep. you know, get the the full image in there without any blur. But um, we can go ahead and move on. This is another one I thought was cool. That's that's some sort of filter, isn't it? That yeah, you're that's shooting? just a, a clear ND filter. And the reason I have that is because I'm reckless with my gear, and that will break versus the end of my lens if I hit it on something. And I've broken probably a dozen of those, and I've broken zero lenses. So, so it actually serves no purpose other than just protection? Correct. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering. It has a little bit of, like, UV filters. If you get one that's just a UV filter, like, <clears throat> you know, for UV light. But it's strictly, for me, just so that way I don't yeah. break my lens. Yeah. So do you, do you prefer, if you had the choice to shoot into the sun or the sun at your back? Does it does it matter to you? Because I know a lot of the photos that I feel like are good that I take personally are shooting into the sun like this. I feel like you get some dramatic lighting in there that you wouldn't get at your back. Yeah, so I mean, it really just depends on like what you're doing. Like as a whole, I would much rather shoot into the sun with like a backlit subject. Um, shooting, if I was shooting strictly like product or, you know, trying to just shoot something that didn't have a bunch of like harsh shadows on it. Sometimes I'll shoot like with the sun on it. So that way there's no shadows on it. If you just manipulate the light, right. Um, and in the same sense, you can do a lot of things with the shadows. If you shoot like with the sun on your subject, but like if I was shooting, you know, like if you said, Hey, I need, you know, you handed me a product and you're like, I need 10 good photos of this. Like I'm going to shoot almost all of them into the sun. Okay. You just, you it just looks better you have more control over it and yeah i think there's something about like the backlit subject yeah especially really when the sun's low yeah. and like the golden hour look yeah it separates it a lot from the background which necessarily that's not doing that a whole lot in this one but i think the fact that you use the sun to split the nd filter and kind of get some of it in the the area where the bulk is at and then some into the focus i think is a pretty cool image yeah this one here, I, this is one of these photos that I think just tells a story. Yeah, it's, it's just not, abstract. There's, yeah, there's nothing spectacular that you don't just look at it and you're like, wow, what a picture. Yeah. It's literally the story on the tailgate. I think that's just a way to separate yourself, I would say. Yeah, that photo still drives me nuts because my door's open. Like, I look at that photo and I'm like, a freaking door's open. See, that's like, that, see. That, that goes right back to what we were just talking about, though. It's like, it depends on who looks at it because yeah. I've looked at this photo 10 times by now and I've never noticed that the door's open. Good, because that's like the first thing I know. <laughs> yeah, I literally all I see is one sixty two and five eighths, yeah. and I see a little bit of the rack. And other than that, I kind of move on. There's one of the the dog photos you're talking about. Yep, that's your specialty right there, dude. That's like the hardest thing in the world to shoot is freaking dogs. Man. Is it? Yes, like God, it's so hard. Like 
I would. They don't. I, they don't listen. We're talking about shooting dogs with a camera too, by the way. We don't shoot dogs <laughs> yeah. with guns. We I'm, like well, actually, I'm talking about shooting dogs with a cannon. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, shooting. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds. <laughs> I was like, I hope you get that. Nico's like, you sick son of a. <laughs> Yeah, shooting dogs. Dude, if I take 10,000 photos of dogs, I'm going to have like 20 that I'm like, oh, these are good. Yeah. They just move so fast and they always have dumb looks on their face and they're just hard to like capture good. Any of these? I think we still have, we still have a few more uh, questions. Are, are there anything, is there anything else, X's and O's, Jordan, that you can think of that people would want to know? I think I got to the Instagram no, questions. I, mean, I think we've been pretty thorough. Um don't want to take too much of his time either. I'd like to get to oh, just he kind said of he's the, here till midnight. The ones that uh, maybe the one a few of them that people sent in, and then yeah, kind of wrap it up. Yeah. Um. So, so how much time so he, do you typically get to hunt? As far as you know, you're not working, or is that just? I guess that probably depends on the the year too as well. But it seems like you've been pretty successful as i'll show here in a second there's another one of my favorites we'll go back all these dang deer that you've got on here uh somehow you're gonna say that you don't have any time to hunt but i look at this on here and i'm like man he must really get after it when he gets <laughs> time to go and he must know what he's doing yeah so <clears throat> i get <sighs> when i work for greg and i did the tv thing I would be gone pretty much like gone for two weeks, home for like a few days and then like gone for two weeks and like home for a few days again, like all season. So <clears throat> like when I was home, I was hunting either like mornings or evenings every day that I was home. So, you know, like I think the last year that I worked full time for him, um, <clears throat> I maybe hunted six days in November total. Luckily, I killed one, but now it's like my busiest two weeks of the year now are the first two weeks of November. Like yeah. the first two weeks of November, I bet I worked 70 to 80 hours like each week, the first two weeks of November. And that's like when you want to be in a tree. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like I can walk out my back door and go hunting and like that's a benefit to like work for me. Like I can consider that work. So, you know, like I don't by any means get to hunt every single day, especially like during November, um, during the early season, it's a little easier because, you know, I have the luxury of hunting. Like, you know, all my farms are, are fairly close to my house. I don't have a super far drive. So I can, you know, I can sneak out and, you know, get in a tree in the evenings when it gets dark at seven o'clock. But, you know, during November, you know, I mean, during November this year, I bet I hunted, you know, obviously I hunted weekends, um, you know, and then I would, I would hunt a morning or an evening or two, you know, once or twice a week probably. Um, so, I mean, I would say I hunt more than like the average guy unless he takes, you know, like my brother takes the first two or three weeks of November off every year. So like That's he, what I was gonna... you know, he hunts, I wouldn't say more than me, but he hunts like better conditions than I do. Cause oh. I don't think I hunted, I don't think I hunted the first two weeks in November for myself one time this year, maybe like one Sunday um, and like a Saturday evening. But from like November like 3rd to like the 12th or the 13th, um, which is like the best time to be hunting. That's no, your I brother? was staring at my computer. Uh-oh. So See, we, we have a question. It's from um, his brother. <laughs> we have a question from someone named Logan. That's who sent him in yeah. Instagram who asked, who kills bigger bucks, you or your brother? Oh, man. <clears throat> well, from what it sounds like, he gets the better time to hunt. But I'm from the pictures, I don't know how, how it could be the alternative. Because if you guys are both hammering some big it's, ones, I would kind of want to know where the farm's at and if you're uh, <laughs> leasing any of it or if it's available. It's, uh, oh, God, I don't even want to admit it, but it's pretty close. Like Is it here? No. no, no. Oh, I, <laughs> I mean, who kills bigger woo. deer, me or him? <laughs> Like right. it's, it's actually right behind the studio. Yeah, I was about to say, oh, uh, this was like super close to an Onyx pin for me. I was like, what the I heck? was getting ready to say, I'm, that might have that might have ruined it for me. We might not even posted this. Um, so, no, but it's between me and him. It's it's honestly pretty close. Um, I used to, but like the last couple of years, he's been on a tear. 
You know, he's uh, killed like I don't know. I mean, he killed a 185 and a 177 in like back to back years. Did I see? Did your your dad? Did he kill like a giant with a recurve? Yeah. Or something? So my dad like makes his own bows. Like my dad hunts with like bows that he makes himself. That's um, that's yeah. Awesome. And he killed. Um, it was it's, he killed a 177 with it, and then on like October 3rd, a couple of years ago, he killed a mid 160s with a, a bow that he made. <laughs> it's like he can only shoot like 17 yards, and he's just hey, like, that's all you need. Down. That's all you need when you're on him. So, will you tell us a little bit about the picture on the top left? Is that does that buck right there? What does he score? Is he close to 200? Yeah, so he was like 195 and some change. Um, <clears throat> and that deer, that deer was only four years old, and he oh. grew like. 50 inches from the year before and that was just like one of those deer that like this rarely happens for me but i was like okay i'm gonna kill this deer it's just a matter of like when am i gonna kill it because like he would daylight all the time on camera and i would see him a lot and it was just a matter of time like i'm like if i kill him before like the rut like i'm gonna kill him but i was like nervous that i wasn't going to because he was gonna get killed but he yeah. was just so consistent that I killed him on October like 27th, I think. And that was when I was doing TV and dude, it was just eating me alive. Cause I would be like gone for like two weeks or, <clears throat> you know, like I was on that moose hunt, got home and I just like have a bunch of pictures of him Cause I got home like early October and it's like, I could have killed this deer and I was gone and it's just a sickening feeling. But yeah, luckily I, I killed him. Is it highly pressured around as far as were you neighbor worried about neighbors yeah so where i killed him um there's like it's just a it's an 80 acre chunk but there's like five acres of like huntable ground and every it was pretty much just like a fence row and a finger where i killed him and there was every single neighbor was hunting him yeah and you know it's like it, i used to we used to have a lot bigger and a lot more deer to hunt but you know like we're surrounded by a bunch of people now and our quality and quantity has just gone downhill and you know it's like the farms that that we hunt you know like my home farm i'm gonna tell you the last time i killed a deer on my home farm and you know when i was a kid it was super good and now it's just like not even worth your time to hunt it would you say that that buck right there actually helped propel your instagram and i mean as far as i, I know a lot of people had to have seen that deer. Did that help you make some more connections and kind of build on your following? I mean, or were you, I, I know you were already, you were already going, you were already on the rise for sure at that point, if not already there, but throwing that on top of it. I mean, that's just like the icing on the cake. Like yeah, I mean, that, to be able to kill one almost 200 inches and then take, you know, these awesome photos with it. It's pretty hard to do. Yeah, so actually those photos come from one of my buddies, Jonah from Iowa, and he was uh, he was actually in Ohio, and I called him when I killed that deer, and he drove through the night and took those pictures the next morning. So I can't take credit for those photos, but he literally pulled an all-nighter and drove to me to take those. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, like, when I posted that, it, I don't even remember how many times that post got sent. It was a lot, but, you know, I didn't get, like, any work from that post, obviously, but um nothing like, direct from no, it but it no, probably but, did help you grow a little bit yeah yeah <clears throat> um so we have a question <laughs> natty neil he wants to know did you kill a buck named kevin bull in the state of oklahoma God, he's such an idiot i keep hearing i i did a little bit i didn't do much research but i don't know what this has to do with Oklahoma. Does it have anything to do with Oklahoma? I don't know what his correlation to Oklahoma is. So he's just coming up with that on his own? I guess. <laughs> what's the what's the reasoning behind the name on the buck, though? It'll shut off, by the way. What shut off? My headphones. You can't hear me? No. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you are. Okay. We, we're, we're back. We had a slight technical difficulty. We've had a lot of technical <clears throat> difficulties, but what part did you not hear, do you think? I heard <laughs> um, question. I heard did you kill a deer named Kevin Bull in Oklahoma and then that's all I heard then I heard something else about Oklahoma what did I miss there did I I think I got the I think question I think that's asking. the gist of it yeah, yeah he's wanting I, I just want to know what the correlation behind well mainly you said nothing correlates with Oklahoma on that one but why is why is the deer's named Kevin Bull <clears throat> so <laughs> there's I killed this deer named Kevin Bull, and 
it's just this like old eight pointers, like super fat deer. And we like didn't know what to name him. And we were just like going through trail camera pictures one night and we were watching American Ninja Warrior. And there's this dude, his name was Kevin Bull. My brother's like, <laughs> ah, let's just name him Kevin Bull. I'm like, that's kind of sick. So yeah, that's where Kevin Bull came from. Yeah. That's... We got another question for you. Um, how do you balance noodling with off-season whitetail duties? Um, and also, this is this may be a more personal question for me. It hmm. sounds like just from who sent this question that maybe there's some animosity that you're you're noodling when you're supposed to be and noodling uh, doing off-tail. You got the noodle off-tail with whitetail. Somebody you know, in particular. And yeah, is noodling with Hannah Barron? It's she taking away from your off season whitetail duties. She's I, not. He's, I think he's in a relationship. Are you in a relationship? I am actually. So that, she's, that's, that's actually the correlation to Oklahoma. Oh, that's, okay. That's where so the, he did know about yeah. Oklahoma. He just lied on camera, yeah, but that's, that's where the Oklahoma correlation comes from. She's from Oklahoma. How did you get started hogging though? Like, when did you do that? So, obviously, that question comes from Gavin. Yeah, I met Gavin in college, and I got a picture of him on here. Do you really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So there's Gavin. Um, Is I'm that a, the 35 lens, by the way? Um, yes, it was. Actually. Look at that. <clears throat> We're learning. Um, yeah. So I met Gavin in college, and you know, I've always just been kind of a reckless individual. And he's like, "Hey, you want to go noodling?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And then, so now Gavin's like one of my best friends. Um, and funny story is, you know, Gavin somehow got my Snapchat when I was in college. And mm. me and Gavin, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like not a super like outgoing individual, especially like when I was in college. So I would like walk into class and I would just like sit in the back corner by myself. And um, some somebody asked me one day, they're like, Blake, have you killed a deer this year? And I was like, yeah, I was like, I killed one, you know, whatever. And. Um, he's like, oh, you got a picture of him. I was like, yeah. So I like showed it to him and then like Gavin seen it. And like at the time, Gavin wasn't like a super big deer hunter. And so oh, he likes in it now. He's he, deep in oh, it. Oh yeah. And so he's seen this photo and he's like, well, he's like, who is this guy? Cause I was like, I mean, it was a, it was like a 150 some inch 10 pointer. And Gavin was, he was just like distraught that I wasn't like, oh, this is a giant deer. Um, and so Gavin just bugged me about deer hunting to the point where I just like became his friend. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. A rough we, start. We joke about that all the time. It's like, you know, I'm not one to just go make buddies with like random people. You know, obviously like I've had to with work, but he just like he would just ask me questions all the time and he would he was like, How do I kill this deer? And I'm like, dude, you're asking the wrong guy first. So did of you all, like but... trade him for like photography advice for a noodling trip or yeah, exactly. is, that, is that how that yeah. went? He was like, Gavin, if you teach me to take photos and noodle. I don't know if I'm a guy that would get you would probably do it, wouldn't you? Would you noodle? Mm-hmm. Maybe. When, once, <laughs> once you do it the first time, you're going to be like, oh, it's not bad. Yeah, he said he stuck his hand in worse places. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you guys have any wrap-up questions? You, you guys, let me know when you're, you're the... ready for my final question. Um, let's make sure. Question. Yeah, go I ahead. I'm ready. What was your most memorable trip? That's, on. that's a good one. <clears throat> kind of missed that. Oh, man. I would say probably, probably the elk hunt that I went on this year, just because it was like Utah. Yeah, just like I'll probably unless I go like back there, like you Next know, year somewhere it's Colorado that, public land, maybe public land Colorado. I don't know. See me and Jordan try to kill each other. We, <laughs> yeah, we, we need a to... fourth, <clears throat> and we need someone who's not going to uh, hit the SOS button on day two. <laughs> yeah, that's really the only stipulation is uh, if you can carry carry you... weight on your back and then not like have a panic attack on us in the tent, then you're, you're good to go. I mean, I, I am pretty fat and out of shape, so you may like leave me behind, but I don't, I don't want to, don't you call my dad fat and out of shape. No, 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 not you. I'm not talking about you, but I went, we did a two man a couple years ago (laughs) and listen, I love Evan. Evan's a close friend of mine, but he, he kind of let himself go before the trip and he made it in and almost out. So like it, I'm, I'm fully convinced that it's you, all meant. If I had you to say, say you, say, you say he almost made it out, like he's like still he laying there. Out, on the side but of there the was some. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to blow him up on the podcast. He might have pooped his pants. We don't talk about. <laughs> it. We don't say nothing about it. We don't bring it up. Dude, but uh, you probably it's had, all mental. 
you probably had him loaded down with like 140 pounds of elk quarters and then yeah. you're like i'll carry your antlers you did yeah i was like i'll uh carry the horns out for some Straight photos up. of that we you know it's, we, a, it's a mental it's a mental game like i i the the guy who tapped out was i mean he was a little skinny guy he just you want a he was real like, yeah, cluster buck experience you're gonna go on one of these trips with us because we talk about this so much it obviously has a lasting effect on us like every episode it will be mentioned <laughs> it's like and it's i don't know it's like you're in the moment. It's the worst thing you've ever done, but it's also the coolest thing you've ever done. Yeah, and like, yeah, that maybe that moment sucked, but looking at you're talking about it. Yeah, I exactly. mean, it, yeah, <clears throat> I, I don't know. It would be it would be memorable if we showed up and shot a bull like off the road and then like went home. We'd be like, oh yeah, we did that. But that's illegal. Um, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> to some, well, it depends on where you're at in that state, but um, I don't know. All Suffering right. makes it so much better i got another question before we get out of here do you have any like crazy stories of stolen gear uh broken cameras sd card corrupts anything that just jumps out to you maybe some questionable people questionable people along the way oh man any Um, altercations knock on wood i haven't had any stolen gear or sd card malfunctions that's a good yeah that's promising yeah but i feel like you're probably staying at some point that will happen yeah you're probably not in the most shady of places either when you're out on these hunting trips. Most of the time, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like you're hanging out. Yeah. It's not like I'm in. Yeah. Know, like, we know. We know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever ran any like sketchy individuals. Um, as far as like broken cameras or anything. Um, I mean, I've dropped my camera out of a tree twice actually um, and broke the uh, dropped my R5 out of the tree with a 70 to 200 on it, like broke the mount on the 70 to 200 and on my R5. Um, you ever had somebody ask you to <laughs> take some weird, like what, <laughs> have you ever had any weird photo requests or surprisingly film not. Pic- like come take a picture of my dead cat or dead dog? No, thank God. What's the one thing that, uh, boy door, boy door. How do you say that? Like the lingerie. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking. You've never about. tried to get into that. No, I could. I mean, wouldn't be a bad career for an individual. <laughs> a Hunter's one. looking for a career change. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm happy where I'm at. All right, final one. Um, you're on the road a lot, you're driving around or all these trips. What is your go-to fast mm-hmm. food stop? Oh man, such a loaded question. I feel like it's a gas station based on the cup. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I, I mean, mean you, you travel. There's different regions have different fast food chains. Really? Uh, where you're like, that's, where when you see it, you're like, that's where we're that's where we're stopping. Yeah. So if I'm going out west and I drive, dude, and I see a Slim Chickens, Slim Chickens, what is that? Yeah, dude, I'm pulling into Slim Chickens. It's better than Chick Fil A. It's different it's than Chick Fil A. It's just built different. Yeah. It's like. You know, you can go to Chick Fil A around here. You know, you can't go to Slim's around here. You can't so go like, to no Slim Chickens. No, you got to capitalize on that opportunity <laughs> when it presents itself. You that's, know, that's so. When you say West, because I in Colorado, I've never seen a Slim Chickens. Is that a New Mexico thing? Is so that it's just like, like uh, Utah. It's like a Kansas, like Oklahoma thing. It's like the only reason I'm with my okay. girlfriends because there's a Slim Chickens like right by our house. Don't tell her. <laughs> don't tell her I said that. Though. Where's she from? Oklahoma. Really? Yeah. Long distance. Long distance. Man. Well, we won't get too deep into that. I do have one more question from uh, Instagram. I don't want to leave this dude out. Um, His name's Owen. He's got a question. Who's the best bow hunter you've met? I assume he means probably who you filmed with or... Right. Oh, man. Maybe just the coolest guy, like, or the girl, you know, whoever. I feel like I'm throwing people under the bus here. Just throw, you don't have to necessarily pick one. You can pick multiple. So I would say best bow hunter would be, you know, like overall bow hunter would be Greg. You know, that's just probably experience based more than anything. He's just a smart individual. I would say like whitetail specifically would be probably Ben Harshine. He, um, Ben is from Iowa. He's a whitetail properties agent and I filmed Ben and me and him just threw two stands and sets of sticks on our backs and went and hunted this farm. And he had like a very high level outlook 
like on chasing deer. Like I learned a lot from him. Um, so I'd say he's probably like the overall like best bow hunter. You know, like if you if you took me and put me on a farm and said go kill a deer, and you put Ben on a farm and said go kill this deer, like Ben's gonna kill a deer before I am. And he's like he's super smart guy. He's got that extra sense about he it. He does. He's like got a sixth sense of like oh. yeah, yeah. So did we? Was that your question earlier, Jordan? Was that the the ending question? Yeah. The the. Uh, so let me let me ask you, what's your go to fast food? Anywhere, Mine? anywhere across the country, since you're such a traveling man, you lived in two different states. So I think when I was out west, I craved Culvers because like they don't have very many out there. That's but why now you want that I'm back. <laughs> Culvers. You now that I'm now that I'm here, like. I miss in and out, but if every time I've went to Colorado on the way home, I think except for when uh, me and Nico were driving back after that last trip, and I think I tried to search one out and we couldn't stop, but I always try to hit up the Culver's and Glenwood Springs like every time. Yeah, I could see that. What about what about gas station, Jordan? You uh, do you crave Casey's when you come back to the Midwest? Oh, I do. I didn't one. have Casey's breakfast pizza for we stopped years. I didn't have it for years, and the first thing I feel I sorry got for you. when I moved back when I moved back to the Midwest, um, the first thing we ordered in the house was we ordered in Casey's a taco pizza. I bet that um, grease just uh, went into your uh, veins. It was yeah, so good. I mean, you, yeah. they're everywhere here. You, they don't know what Casey's is out west. I'm like, you know, you know, Casey's pizza. And they're like, no, we we don't know what that is. And I'm like, you're, I would, you're really missing out. Literally uncultured individuals out there. Yeah, like, yeah. To put it in a perspective, I would, I would be happy with my career with this whole thing that we're doing. If Casey's sponsored us and gave us like, you know, twenty five bucks a week or something for think, either pizza, breakfast, burrito. I think one of the yeah, highlights of my mm-hmm. career was Casey's posting a photo that I took when I worked for Greg. Oh man, did yeah. you not link up with them after that? You didn't. I was like, can I get some like Fountain Mountain Dews out of this or something? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Hunter, Hunter's got a conflict of interest because his diverge photo was taken at Hux. El Dorado Hux. El Dorado or El Dorado? El Dorado. Mm. Or you think it's El, Dor- El Dorado? I don't know. My wife that, that doesn't was a even question. Know, that so. was a statement. El Dorado, Illinois. You know, home of the controversy. Did you see that elbow the other day? I kid? did see that elbow. That's pro- your- that's probably what I would have did to you if like we elbow hurt around the around the region. That kid. Oh man. Yeah, that kid's famous now. What would we have done if Blake tonight? You know, we just I asked the wrong question and. You know, would we have had to had a school board meeting? That, you asked him that basketball question at the beginning of the championship, and he might have been like, "Yeah, you remember one of these?" and just gave you <laughs> right across the jaw. Yeah, that that would have done it for me. Um, yeah, <laughs> then we could have fired everybody here. We could have quit this podcast. But I think this is definitely our our best one so far. Dude, a lot of uh, must have had some real winners on there. Then. <laughs> a lot of uh, I don't know. I just felt like we had a lot of. A lot of good questions. A lot of we covered a lot as far as in-depth stuff with cameras that uh, people might be learning out there. And if you're still learning, go ahead and reach out to us. Reach out to Blake. I'm sure he would answer you. We'll yeah. probably answer you first. And you know, if he can get to you, he'll get to you. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we're we're able to uh, we're able to tag. Do you got a YouTube channel? I, no, I do not. Actually, you, can, you guys probably won't believe this. Your, I've never we can add your Instagram handle. I've Dude, never comments. killed a deer on film. I've never self-filmed a hunt in my Stop. life other than the one hunt with Greg. How do we, can we <laughs> sign him right now? Like a contract? Come, listen, like I've already killed an elk. Come out. I'll run a camera for you. It's not going to be on. I might not have batteries. Let me but run the camera. You with it. Don't let him ever run a camera for you. You know what? If I kill an elk, if you put me on an elk, you could film me on a, I'd even let you film me on your Android. Hey, we'll, we, I can get you on a bull, but don't. Here's the thing if you hunt with Hunter is he's going to tell you to shoot a cow, that you never shoot a cow. If you shoot a cow, you can't shoot a bull. I can just tell you after thousands of dollars of tags and coming home empty with no meat after spending weeks away from home, you should probably take the first thing that walks in. It worked out in this case. He got a bull out of it. Um, but, yeah, we, we potentially could have killed two. We would have never got both of them out, but. We're we we're here today, and we're uh, 
we're moving on from it. So potentially Blake's coming on next year. He's going to film a deer with us, or we're going to film him killing a deer. Self film, whatever it takes. Well, you f- you filmed that one. You said it yeah, was just totally was out of that's, focus. Yeah, that's the only one. Doesn't I count use. then. No, yeah, it doesn't count. <laughs> that's understandable. All right, is that about wrap well, it up? You. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for making yeah, the long drive great. down. Yeah, an hour away. It's like maybe Hunter, just maybe Hunter will give you a hat. Yeah. All right, I have a bag for him. A little <laughs> gift bag. Right. So, all right, I guess we can. Uh, play the outro music also if you're if you're interested go to etsy we got 25 percent off through the rest of the week oh yeah hit it all right bye everybody